first off, I'd, I'd like to welcome, you know, everyone uh, and thank everyone for attending Hanson Med's Table Talk webinar today. Um, there are still and will continue to be some trying times uh, for many of us, if not all of us here today. Uh, whether you're a general practitioner, a specialist, a hygienist, an office manager, a dental student, uh, the way uh, we're working and studying and researching uh, and treating our patients uh, is different and certainly has its, uh, its challenges. Uh, but luckily, uh, we have this safe uh, environment where we can grow and develop uh, and enhance our knowledge on subjects. Uh, this place where we have hope for a better world. And of course, uh, this place is to entertain us and to inspire us. Um, I don't think there's anyone better to have with us today than uh, Dr. Sheik. Um, today, I'm delighted to host uh, Dr. Zishan Sheik uh, on the topic of improving bone defect repair. Um, to give just a quick introduction, um, Currently, Dr. Sheik's doing a lot. Uh, he's uh, currently a resident at Dal, Dalhousie University in the, in the Graduate Paradigmatics Program. Uh, he's a president of the National Student Research Group, which is part of the Canadian Association of Dental Research. Uh, he is participating in a lot of webinars, uh, doing consulting as well on the side. Um, as a bit of a history, uh, worked at Mount Sinai Hospital, did your PhD at McGill University as well, um, and works with a lot of the other top doctors uh, across Canada and, and all over the world. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to kind of hand it over here to Dr. Uh, Zishan Sheik, and uh, you're good to go. <laughs> Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And uh, again, thank you to Hansamet for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I hope that these 45 minutes and an hour worth of presentation and question answers will uh, kind of uh, uh, be interesting and uh, not another run of the mill sort of a webinar. I, I did try to uh, kind of amalgamate the research side with the clinical side to kind of keep it interesting for people, uh, not only in terms of why things work clinically the way they do, but go down a little bit to the molecular level and kind of understand how these uh, graph materials really work. Um, and, um, and, and, I, and, I, and I thank all the attendees for registering and joining us. And again, uh, many thanks to a lot of people uh, who I already know who are in the attendees list already. Uh, thank you for your support. And uh, with that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen and Steve, if you can let me know if you can see it and then we're ready to go. Okay. So I hope you can see my screen at this point. Yep, we're up and running here. Good to go. Perfect. So what we're gonna be talking about today as a whole is uh, we're going to be talking about this research study we recently published uh, in the Journal of Periodontology, which is the official publication for the American Academy of Periodontology. And uh, we're going to be talking about improved bone defect repair using uh, these novel bone anabolic conjugates we have developed uh, with the existing BIOS granules. And to give a kind of an overview of this research, it is a kind of a multi-institutional and industrial collaborative research program, which we've been carrying out between uh, University of Toronto, Dalhousie University, uh, Mount Sinai Hospital, Simon Fraser out of BC, and um, Mesentech Inc., uh, which is uh, a Canadian biotech uh, company out of British Columbia. So my name is Zishan Sheikh. Um, I'm a clinician scientist. I uh, I'm a, currently a second year perio resident at Dalhousie University and at the same time uh, I also have my research training at Queen Mary University of London and at McGill University for my PhD and then uh, a couple of postdoc fellowships at Mount Sinai and at University of Toronto and I hope to continue being an academic, uh, do research and hopefully a couple of days of private practice in the future once 
I uh, finished my prior residency. So that's me in a nutshell. Um, it's very important for me to disclose any conflicts of interest. So uh, I'd like to let all the attendees know that this event is being sponsored by Hansa Med and I am receiving an honorarium for this talk. Uh, I do serve as a surgical and a biomaterials consultant for Mesentech Inc, which is one of those uh, biotech companies which uh, helps us uh, produce the bone anabolic conjugate. I do not have any other conflicts of interest to disclose in relation to uh, this presentation with any other commercial or non-commercial organization. So we're going to start with talking about bone changes post tooth loss, some bone regeneration concepts, uh, what bone grafts are available, how do they resorb, uh, and how does that affect the clinical aspects of bone regeneration. Uh, and we'll also talk about a little bit about the current limitations of the materials on hand. Uh, and then we'll switch gears and go into what are the alternative options for bone grafting materials. Uh, by, we'll briefly talk about BIOS as a biomaterial option, and then uh, we're going to talk about these new bone anabolic conjugates, which uh, we have developed. And then I'll finish the talk by actually presenting a study, a research study, which has been published, uh, where we combine this, these new conjugates with the BIOS materials. And then we evaluated them in a critical sized um, mandibular defect model uh, to uh, see if we can actually improve the bone ripper and make it faster. And then we'll just talk about the clinical relevance of all of this, and we'll wrap it up with a, a quick question answer session, depending on how much time we have. So briefly, being clinicians, we all know the importance of uh, naturally healthy dentition and bone. Now, what is important is, and that is something which we know that we should not be depending on the OPGs for uh, evaluating the bone level. So we should ideally be using bite wing radiographs. And here on the screen, you can actually see a, a horizontal bite wing radiograph. Uh, and if at all required, you can actually go for a vertical bite wing radiograph if you are expecting uh, any areas where you have periodontal uh, uh, bone uh, loss. Uh, then maybe a horizontal bite wing might not be ideal. So uh, we need to remember that we need to uh, not evaluate bone levels on an OPG. Now, in terms of alveolar bone resorption following tooth loss, we know that after we lose teeth, on average, we lose about 1.5 to 2 millimeters of vertical bone and about 40 to 50% of horizontal bone stock within the first six months of tooth loss. Now, if there is no treatment to restore the dentition, then continued bone loss keeps occurring and it goes up to about 40 to 60% of the ridge volume being lost in the first three years. Now, if you look like at a study from Shrop in 2003, uh, what they show is that in terms of loss of alveolar width in millimeters, you lose about four millimeters in the first three months. It's about five millimeters in six months but you actually lose up to six millimeters of the alveolar width in millimeters at the 12 month part. So this lack of sufficient bone volume and height, if unresolved, eventually proves detrimental to what your final treatment outcome you anticipate as a clinician, uh, especially when you're talking about implant success. This requires the clinicians or the surgeons or the periodontist to perform bone augmentation procedures in order to prepare the alveolar ridge prior to placing your dental implants. Now, when we talk about bone grafting, we know that it is frequently performed to not only repair or to regenerate bone defects in the craniofacial region. And although we have a variety of surgical techniques and in combination with various natural and synthetic graft replacement materials, we do not have an ideal technique or material which exists currently for us to use in our clinics. Some of the approaches to achieve bone augmentation include uh, direct or indirect sinus lift procedures. You can use alveolar ridge expansion. 
you can have distraction osteogenesis. However, there is a main complication of either fracture and you see complications in more than one third of these cases. So although you, you can actually gain a lot of bone tissue, but you do have these inherent complications which come with this uh, surgical technique. You also have onlay bone grafting in which you take your bone graft and you place it as an onlay and screw it on top of the bone and you would want to have the bone, uh, new bone tissue integrate up into the graft material. Uh, however, the main complication of onlay bone grafting by using an autologous bone, which we'll talk about uh, later, uh, is morbidity at the donor site. Then we also have guided bone regeneration, uh, where what you do is you pack the defect with graft material and you protect it with a membrane. Uh, the biggest problem with that is there's unpredictable height gain. It's not very predictable and the long-term stability of the vertically augmented bone tissue is unpredictable. This takes us into, let's like try and talk a little bit about the bone regeneration concepts so that we understand how the regeneration and augmentation of bone tissue really happens. So osteoconduction occurs when bone graft material serves as a scaffold for new bone growth, which is perpetuated by the native bone. In this, what happens is osteoblast from the margin of the defect, which is being grafted, utilizes the bone graft material as a scaffold or a framework upon which to spread and generate new bone. Conversely, osteoinduction is involving the stimulation of the osteoprogenitor cells to differentiate into osteoblasts that begin the new bone formation. And then you have osteogenesis, which occurs when vital osteoblasts, which are originating from the bone graft material itself, contribute to the new bone growth along with the new bone being generated via the other mechanism. So it can be a combination, but we'll talk about the fact that right now it is only the autograft material which gives you uh, not only osteoinduction and osteoconduction, but also osteogenesis. And that is why osteoautografts are considered to be the gold standard per se. Having said that, it being the gold standard, it does have its own limitations, which we're gonna talk about. So it may be the gold standard for now, but it does come with um, a, a lot of downsides as well. So briefly, if we talk about bone regeneration with grafting, uh, there is a requirement for the presence or recruitment of osteoblastic precursors and growth factors at the site of grafting or augmentation. These precursors can be provided either by the graft material, as we mentioned, autografts, or by the recipient bed around the grafting area. The osteoprogenitor cells have been shown to, hold, to infiltrate the graft from the host tissue within the seven days. Now, if you look at the schematic, uh, it kind of explains what uh, uh, you, you expect to happen when you graft the material. You have a graft tissue, you have a recipient bone, bone bed. I'm, I'm gonna try and see if uh, my pointer works. Um, I think my pointer should be visible now. Yep. Yes. Perfect. So what we have is you have your graft material which has been grafted to, into the defect where there's a bone defect and a recipient bed. And then you have these soft tissues on top. The critical step is trying to avoid these soft tissues, which are, for example, the epithelial cells, which grow faster than the bone tissue, to not invade the defect and fill that space. Because if you have the defect filled with soft tissue, you will not have the space or the allowance for the bone to actually grow into the scaffold material. So this is something which is very important for us to remember when we're trying to do bone grafting. Also, the biomaterials or grafts we use are engineered to work as a complex system providing any sort of direction uh, to allow interaction of various host systems. And these biomaterials we use uh, restore and augment softer heart tissues. However, immediately following implantation, host response begins to these biomaterials and it is based on the host response that is initiated uh, we can then expect what sort of a cascade is going to follow so briefly what happens is when you implant these bone graft materials which is point or time zero at zero seconds 
within a less of a second or slightly more than a second, what you have is protein adsorption, which uh, takes place, which is purely the proteins actually covering the graft material. And within the first hour of, infilt of grafting, you have cellular infiltration, which starts happening. And those cells which are being attracted start releasing chemokines and cytokines from these cells within the first and the five days of grafting. Now, based on these, there is recruitment of the tissue repair cells, which happens between five days and about two weeks time point. And post three weeks to four weeks, what you have is the fibrous encapsulation and granulation tissue formation and neovascularization, which is taking place. So this kind of gives you an idea of what really happens when you actually place these graft materials in a bone defect. Another important concept which we have to keep in mind is biodegradation or the resorption of these graft materials. Now, biodegradation can be envisioned as an in vivo process by which either a material breaks down into simpler components, which reduces the complexity of the chemical compounds by the action of different cells, or there is a physical breakdown such as passive dissolution of ions or particulate fragments, which are then taken away by macrophages by the action uh, known as phagocytosis, or the material can be lost by chemical erosion, which is based on the changes in the pH. We have to remember that initial resorption of calcium phosphate biomaterials happens by the phagocytosis by macrophages. And this is due to the small particle formation, which happens due to either passive dissolution or the process of disintegration of these graft materials. The cells that take part in this cell mediated resorption may be osteoclasts, multinucleated giant cells, monocytes, or macrophages directly available in the bone marrow tissue. Now, what is important is to know what effect of particle size of these graft materials is crucial in terms of whether you can expect these graft materials to resorb fast, slow, or none at all. So what happens is that macrophages respond to small particles, which are less than 10 microns in diameter, by the process of internalization and then kind of digesting them after they have been ingested. However, if your particle size is larger than 10 microns, but smaller than 100 microns, the macrophages then have to fuse together to form giant cells, which then in turn engulf and these particles and digest them intracellularly. However, if your particles are larger than 100 microns, then the bulk digestion is carried out by extracellular degradation, which is by lowering the pH by, for example, producing enzymes, which start to chemically erode these graft material surfaces. So you can kind of imagine based on this information that particle size of your graft materials and the crystal size of your graft material plays a crucial role in terms of how quickly your graft is going to re resorb or not resorb. Now, I like to, now that information is all good, but as a clinician, it kind of makes more sense when we see it visibly. So that is where I feel that my um, expertise as a biomaterial scientist and having access to these microscopic images, which I have based on my research, uh, gives you a more visualization sort of, uh, of what goes on. So here we see three graph materials. On the top, you see calcium polyphosphate, and on the bottom, you have brushite known as dicalcium phosphate dihydrate. And on the right is dicalcium phosphate anhydrous, which is uh, monotype. Now, these three biomaterials you can see are at a magnification of 50 times. Now, when we start going higher in magnification, it starts getting interesting because now what you cannot see with the naked eye, which is actually happening at the bone graft site, can actually, you can start imagining and visual, visualizing them. So you can see that now you can see the, you know, the surface topography getting a little clearer about these three materials. When you go to thousand time magnification, you can see that for the calcium polyphosphate, and this is, these are the scale bars, you can see this particle size being this big, whereas these two materials still seem to be more having smaller particles. 
it gets even more interesting when you go to 5,000 times magnification. And now you're starting to see the surface topography a lot better for these biomaterials. What is important is when you have a human neutrophil or a macrophage, which then has to come on these biomaterials, you can imagine that on the top, you're actually on a flat land and you're asking somebody to eat something which is bigger than them. Whereas when you look at the biomaterials on the bottom half, you have these cells which can now try to actually eat these particles which are going to be easier because they're smaller than them themselves, right? It gets even more clearer when you go to 20,000 times magnification. And this kind of gives you a clear indication. Now, this is a schematic, but if you actually look at this micrograph, you actually see a human blood-derived neutrophil trying to engulf these dicalcium phosphate particles. It gets even more clearer when you do a cross-sectional tom tomographic imaging and where you see this human neutrophil has actually engulfed a crystal of these graph materials. And not only is the crystal inside the cell, but it is actually starting to degrade and fragment and is being digested. So this kind of gives you an indication why some materials will resorb faster, some will resorb slower, some will probably not resorb at all. And we'll talk about that as well. So what is important to remember is that for rapidly resorbing materials, it is the macrophages and giant cells that participate actively in the early resorption process. However, in contrast for slowly resorbing grafts, you have osteoclast type cells, which are mostly resorbable for the degradation once implanted. So let's talk about some of the bone replacement graft materials. So first of all, if we had to make an ideal graft material, what are the properties we want them to have? We want them to be biocompatible and not have any undesired side effects without any complications. Ideally, they should be osteogenic, osteoconductive, and osteoinductive, as we talked about previously. They should be able to stimulate neovascularization, so the ability to promote new blood vessels to grow and infiltrate into the matrix. They ideally should have a biodegradation profile, which matches with the rate of the newborn formation. And the analogy I'd like to give here is when you are making a building or a structure, you have scaffolds outside, right? Now, as the floors keep going up, the scaffolds keep going up, but once the building's finished, you take the scaffold away. So ideally, in an in vivo biological environment as well, you want the scaffold to be replaced by the new bone tissue at a rate which matches the resorption of the graft with the formation of the bone. They should not be antigenic and should not cause carcinogenic reactions. These graft materials, if they're ideal, should provide the mechanical properties that provide adequate support and stability according to the intended application of use. And very importantly, they should be easy to handle and be available with sufficient quantities at a relatively low cost. And this is why it is important for us to have more clinicians being interested in science and bridging the science between biomaterials and uh, clinics, because you can arguably make a very uh, ideal sort of material in the lab, but when it goes into the hands of the clinicians, if it is technique sensitive, it's not going to work because you need to cater to the level of expertise for not only the experts, but also to beginners. So ideally, you should have a graph material which can be used predictably by all uh, clinicians with varying levels of expertise. Some of the sources of bone grafting materials are autographs, which are taken from the human, uh, the, the human uh, themselves and transplanted to another site. You can have allografts coming from human cadavers. Uh, you can have xenografts coming from animal sources, and then you have alloplasts, which are the synthetic uh, graph materials. So if you talk about the autographs, and we'll talk about quickly about them uh, in the later slides, you can have them as extraoral or intraoral by the site of where you can get them. Uh, then you have the allografts, which can 
uh, be fresh or frozen bone, which is not used. Uh, and we'll talk about that why. And then you have the freeze-dried bone allografts or the demineralized freeze-dried bone anographs. Then you have the non-human sources, which are xenografts, uh, which can be porcine bone, bovine, equine, and coralline calcium carbonate. And then you have the alloplasts, which have a plethora of materials such as bioactive glasses, various calcium phosphates and calcium uh, sulfates, etc. So when we talk about autographs, these are harvested from a donor site in the same individual and transplanted to another site in the same body. This is the source of the most osteogenic organic material. However, there are some side effects to this uh, procurement of autographs. So if you look at the advantages, we know that autographs are biocompatible, osteoconductive, osteoinductive, high osteogenic potential, adequate mechanical strength, and you can actually procure them in both cortical and cancellous types. However, their disadvantages are you need to add another additional surgery to take these materials. You're increasing the operative time cost. There is a donor side morbidity and post-operative pain associated with them. Uh, you have increased risk of fracture or complication at the site where you took the donor graft from. And there's only so much you can take away in terms of uh, depending on what sort of grafting uh, procedure you want to do. So there is a limit to how much bone graft you can take from one site from a body and then put it in the other. So as we mentioned earlier, autographs used in periodontal regeneration may be of the extraoral or intraoral origin. In terms of the intraoral autographs, the most common harvest sites are the spina nasalis, the tuberosity, uh, the maxilla, the ramus, retromolar area, and the symphysis region of the mandible, as well as taking bone from bony exostases and the bone harvested from different sites using bone scrapers. These autographs are commonly used as either chips, blocks, or milled small particles. However, when you talk about autographs obtained from extra oral sites, then the most common area which used to be used is iliac crest, and it is not used that commonly anymore uh, because there is uh, morbidity uh, associated with it. So also it's important to know is that cortical autographs have high initial strength, uh, which after about six months of implantation is about 50% weaker than the physiologically normal bone tissue. The cancellous bone autographs are initially weak because of their porous structure, but they gain strength over time. So this is important to know uh, when you use these materials that where you're intending to use these. Uh, the cancellous autographs, based on their structure, revascularize earlier than the cortical grafts around the fifth day after implantation due to their spongy architecture. And then when we talk about allografts, these are, as mentioned earlier, tissues taken from genetically non-identical members of the same species, so from other humans and usually cadavers. Now you can have cancellous and cortical allografts of various particle sizes, which are used for bone regeneration procedures. And these are available for applications uh, in form of cortical wedges, cortical chips, granules. You can have cancellous powdered prepared as frozen, not used anymore. Uh, freeze-dried, mineralized. When I say frozen, I meant um, the fresh frozen is not used. The frozen still is. And the meat demineralized bone. So as mentioned a couple of times, we don't use the fresh frozen type of cancellous bone uh, because of disease transmission and antigenicity. However, this does allow you to have the highest osteoconductive and osteoinductive potential amongst the other allograft materials. But for obvious reasons, we don't use this anymore. When we talk about FDBA, which is the freeze-dried bone allografts, the freeze-drying process distorts the 3D presentation of the human leukocyte antigens on the surface of the particles, which affects the immune recognition, which allows you to use this material without having a reaction to them. These FDBA materials are mineralized and are known to be osteoconductive and can be combined with autografts to enhance the osteogenic potential. Cortical FDBA de demonstrate the highest osteoinductive potential due to the growth factors which are stored in their matrix. 
And you can use these FDBA with combinations with absorbable barrier membranes uh, and can be used as replacement for autograft blocks for ridge augmentation. Also, the FDBA blocks for alveolar ridge grafting have shown the presence of vital bone with lamellar organization of bone. So we know there are two types of bone. One is woven, which is haphazard and disorganized. And then there is these organized laying down of bone, which is known as the lamellar bone, which is what we crave and, and, and want. When we talk about the DFDBA, the difference is that these are demineralized. And these have been used alone or in combination with FDBA and autographs. The DFDBA undergoes resorption at a quicker rate in comparison to its FDBA counterpart and have osteoinductive potential due to the BMPs and other growth factors present in their matrix. However, the limitation is that DFDBA acquired from young cadavers have higher osteogenic potential depending on uh, where the tissue bank or the, so essentially there is a variation between batches uh, based on the different levels of PMPs in different levels of DFDBA coming from the banks uh, based on the age of the uh, cadavers, which you cannot control as a clinician. Then we talk about xenografts, which are graft tissues obtained from non-human species that is mostly animals, and these are usually osteoconductive. The most commonly used for periodontal regeneration is the deproteinized bovine bone material, commercially known as BIOS, uh, and is, is basically available uh, as xenograft of bovine origin. So what happens is that after heat and chemical treatments, the inorganic phase of the bovine bone is left. So the organic component is taken away. And you what you essentially have left is the hydroxyapatite, which retains the porous architecture. You can also have coralline, porcine, and equine bone uh, for this. And then you have the alloplasts, which are synthetics. And these biomaterials are fabricated in various forms and with varying physiochemical properties that can be both deg degradable and non-degradable. Alloplasts are usually osteoconductive without having any osteoinductive or osteogenic potential on their own. Uh, the most commonly used alloplastic materials are calcium phosphate, such as hydroxyapatite, tricalcium phosphate, and bioactive glasses. So if you talk about briefly about calcium phosphates, these are made of an aqueous solution of one or several of these calcium phosphates, which are available. Upon mixing them with water or liquid, they precipitate into a less soluble material, and then they can be used uh, into the defect as either a paste or they can be preset as granules or blocks. When we talk about hydroxyapatite, and here we're talking about synthetics, uh, they have a composition and structure similar to natural bone mineral. These synthetic HA can be used in various forms. You can either have them as porous non-resorbable or solid non-resorbable or resorbable non-ceramic porous. The degradation of this hydroxyapatite depends on how these were actually formulated and made. So if you want actually a material to resorb faster, you can change its processing temperature, which will allow you to either have a very dense material, which resorbs slowly, or you can make a porous hydroxyapatite material, which is expected to resorb faster based on the discussion we earlier had. So at lower temperatures, the particulate HA, which is formed, is very porous and undergoes slow resorption. Then we have the tricalcium phosphate, uh, which has been used and investigated extensively as a bone substitute. It comes as two crystallographic forms, the alpha TCP and the beta TCP. Beta TCP exhibits good biocompatibility and osteoconductivity and is used as a partially resorbable filler allowing replacement with newly formed bone. The resorption of TCP grafts is thought to be dependent on the passive dissolution by biological fluids in the absence of osteoclasts around the materials and also by osteoclast-like giant cells in defect areas. Then we also have the bioactive glasses, which are composed of silicon dioxide, calcium oxide, sodium oxide, and phosphorus pentoxide. 
The particle sizes of these bioactive glasses range usually between 90 to 710 microns to 300 to 355 microns. After implantation of these bioactive glasses, what you have is bone forming on these surfaces, but you have to remember these are non-degradable or non-resorptive materials. So they can work as a filler, but they don't degrade. Um, these are some of the allografts, xenografts, and alloplasts which are available in the market for use right now, which are made by uh, different companies and come with different brand names, but you can categorize them into these three basic uh, categories. And also you can actually uh, see the source of the, uh, the material. However, some of the limitations of these current materials and techniques we've talked about to summarize are achieving long-term stable and predictable results is a challenge. Some materials resorb too fast, some resorb too slowly, or some none at all. These are unpredictable for some applications, so one size does not fit all. There's an additional surgical site required for autografting, which results in trauma, pain, and morbidity. So there is a need to focus on the biology to optimize clinical outcomes for us as clinicians. Uh, this is taken from a paper in 2016 and where they compare the vertical gain and horizontal gain between various uh, graph materials. Um, and again, I'm not going to go too much in detail in this because time does not permit us, but it's interesting to see that there have been comparisons in literature uh, based on, but what I find really interesting is if you look at the xenogenic mixture and the synthetics, uh, at least till 2016, there was no data available for vertical gain with these materials. And then, and also to uh, mention, these are for the particular graphs, and then uh, the same paper actually uh, demonstrates the data for block graphs and the material gain in terms of the vertical height and the horizontal gain. Now, we switch gears to alternatives to autologous bone graphs, and we'll quickly talk about BIOS, which is one of the components of the study which we use with the novel uh, drugs we have produced. So what is Geislick BIOS? Essentially, it is deprotonized bovine bone material, also known as DBBM. It is one of the commonly used bone substitute materials for maxillofacial bone regeneration. To date, there have been more than 1,000 research publications, which are PubMed index, which have been uh, produced and um, uh, shared. Uh, it is processed, purified, and sterilized bovine bone tissue granules without any organic matrix. It does allow for use as a stable scaffold in the long term, and it does not show high resorbability, if at all. So its biodegradation rate is slow. Some studies would almost call it as non-biodegradable. So Geislick Biomaterials is, are, is the company which actually prepares these materials. And you can have them either as Geislick Bios or as Geislick Bios Pen. Now, if we talk about Geislick BIOS, these essentially come as small granules and large granules in various uh, sizes of vials. So if you talk about the small granules, their particle range is 0.25 milli millimeters to one millimeter, and the large granules are one millimeter to two millimeter in terms of size. When we talk about the Geislick BIOS pen, these are available as an applicator. So you can actually apply these faster and more precisely to a surgical size site if it is a well-contained defect. And these also come as small granules or large granules. What is important to discuss is the bimodal pore structure of these materials. The concept of interconnected macropores is very important. Here, what you see is a micrograph showing at 50 times magnification the structure of human bone. And on the right side, you see Geislick BIOS at the same magnification, uh, showing the structure which it has. And you can see it has a sort of a similar bimodal pore structure. This allows for cell migration and high osteoconductive ability. Also, if you go even higher further and you look at the research papers, what we observe is that this material has high capillarity and has a fast liquid uptake. It allows for clot, blood clot stabilization 
and has hydrophilic qualities. This takes us to the newborn anabolic conjugate. Now, there have been research on a variety of molecules to enhance bone regeneration. Several studies have investigated combining either BIOS or other calcium phosphates with biological and synthetic growth factors and molecules such as BMPs, uh, there's EMD, and there are platelet concentrates. Some of the involved mediators in bone regeneration are, uh, for example, um, parathyroid hormone, selective androgen receptor modulators known as SARMs, and the prostaglandin E2. However, in the recent past, there has been an extensive sort of uh, interest and investigative uh, research being performed on BMPs. We're not gonna talk too much about BMPs because we don't have the time for it, uh, but we are more focused on the prostaglandin E2. Now, when we talk about the prostaglandin E2 and its agonists, we need to know that this is a natural lipid hormonal mediator, which is synthesized throughout the body. It stimulates rapid bone formation in animals by activating the prostaglandin receptor 4, known as EP4, found in bone on the osteoblast. The synthetic EP4 agonists have been shown to strongly mimic the effects of PGE2 on bone in animal studies. However, the biggest problem with the systemic administration of PGE2 is the side effects such as pain, inflammation, uh, nausea, diarrhea, hypotension, and uterine contractions, which limits how well or how much you can use this clinically. Which brings us to our conjugate design, which has been uh, formulated based on our collaboration with Simon Fraser University and Mesotank Inc. Now, what our local bone stimulator design is, an inactive bisphosphonate, which is alendronate. So it still targets the bone and binds to the bone, but since it's inactive by its amide portion being capped, it does not affect the osteoclast. So it does not affect remodeling. And you bind with it a potent bone formation stipula stimulator of the prostaglandin E2 receptor known as an EP4 agonist. So what you see in the schematic is um, an alendronate, which is bound to the EP4 agonist by a hydrolyzable linker, which once it would break, would release this bone formation, bone forming uh, molecule in the local environment of the grafting area. So what we initially did is, we did a preclinical study, which was recently published in the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research, where we took a model of postmenopausal osteoporotic uh, rat tissues, and we dosed these animals with our conjugate drug at a low and a high um, uh, concentration, one injection per week for seven weeks. And what we saw is that these drugs, when injected intravenously, reverses osteoporosis, and it brings it back almost to the sham levels, which kind of gave us an indication that this works. Also, what was important is that we did not observe any side effects based on these drugs. And the reason for that is because of the binding of this drug with the alendronate, with a linker, what happens is the alendronate, which is a bisphosphonate, gravitates towards bone. It goes straight to the bone tissue, binds with it. After the half-life of the drug, sorry, once the linker breaks in five days, the EP4 is released only in the local environment and is not free to circulate in the, in the circulation, which uh, is great because we don't want those side effects. So essentially how it works is you have the bisphosphonate with the linker and the EP4. It binds to the bone. The local hydrolytic enzymes break this linker. The EP4 gets released and then produces more bone based on its bone stimulating activity. So we have two conjugate designs known as the C3 and C6. The C3 is simply as I explained one molecule of EP4 plus one uh, molecule of your alendronate with a linker. However, the C6 allows us to conjugate two molecules of the EP4, which means this is expected to be more potent without increasing the concentration or amount of the bisphosphonate. So if the question is that why couldn't we just double the concentration of C3, 
This is a much more smarter molecule, hypothetically, because it has two molecules of EP4 to the one uh, base alendronate. So our idea was, why don't we mix these anabolic conjugates, which we've already shown to work for osteoporosis, with our bone graft materials? And what we did is uh, we published a study in the Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Implants, where I uh, developed these calcium phosphate bone graft materials, which had these conjugates already preloaded into the matrix of the material. And then what we noticed is after implantation on a rabbit calvarial model, that the, the brush height and the monetite grafts, the onlay blocks, not only had better quality bone, but we had a faster bone growth also being shown. So if you look at these, um, these, these graphs at the bottom right of the picture, what you see is that you had a lot higher vertical bone height gained, which was significantly higher uh, in comparison to the control grafts, which does not have these conjugate drugs. So this was something which encouraged us even further to continue researching about uh, the combination of these graft materials uh, with these conjugates. Which brings us to the research study which we developed to evaluate the BIOS with these novel conjugates. Uh, this was recently published in the Journal of Periodontology, as I mentioned, um, which is the official publication for the American Academy of Periodontology. And briefly, our study aim was to investigate whether a combination of the bone forming conjugates and the BIOS granules has the potential to promote bone regeneration and formation using a critical size rat mandibular jaw defect model. Briefly, if you look at the general classification of animal models, you can either have the ectopic or the orthotopic model. Ectopic means you're checking for osteoinduction or osteogenesis. For example, you put it in a non-bone environment and if you can mineralize that area. So obviously we're not checking that. What we wanted to do was use an orthotopic model, which is in bone. And then the reason we wanted to use a critical size defect is, which is very important, because if you use a non-critical size defect, you give it enough time, it's gonna heal on its own. So you don't know whether your material or your combination is the one which is actually working or it's just the natural biology. So we also were using it in a non-weight non bearing application. So we used the mandible. So this is the justification for the, uh, for the model we used. And this model has been used for the past couple of decades. And there are several publications where people have used the bottle for checking um, bone formation using hydroxyapatite or other materials. So the animal model which we used was the rodent model, which is widely available, inexpensive housing. They're easy to handle. They're relatively smaller size, and you don't need too many of them. Um, also, there have been several preclinical studies which have tested biomaterials using bone substitutes, and these are regarded as one of the good choices for in vivo testing of regeneration of the bone tissue. Um, so, uh, what we did is we used a critical size bone defect, as I mentioned. This is the smallest osseous wound that would not heal spontaneously over a period of time. Does not matter how long you leave it, the gap is not going to be bridged. For practical purposes, how we evaluate this is that there is going to be no mineralized area equal or more than 30% after 52 weeks, uh, which would be completed by bony regeneration. And based on the data from previous studies, we found out that the critical size, which does not heal, is either 3.5 millimeters up to 5 millimeters. So anything below 3.5 millimeters uh, sorry, anything below, yes, anything below 3.5 millimeters, you would expect to heal spontaneously. So our hypothesis was that loading the BIOS granules with these conjugated drugs known as C3 and C6, remember C3, one molecule of EP4, C6, two molecules, will result in greater bone formation in these critical size defects when compared with the control graphs without the drugs. So in terms of the study design, we had 24 rats, male rats. So we had bilateral 48 bone defects in the mandible. We had three groups of testing. BIOS control without the drug, 
So it means BIOS as received by the company, BIOS with the C3, and BIOS with C6. The surgical implantation was carried out by one examiner, which was me. Uh, they were euthanized at two different time points at two weeks and four weeks. So we had an N is equals to eight defect per group at each time point. And then we performed histological evaluation. We performed backscattered electron microscopy and also the micro CT. And we used one way ANOVA and a post hoc analysis to test statistical differences between the groups with a significance level set as a P value is less than 0 0.05. So in terms of the methodology, uh, we prepared these granules with the C3 and C6 co conjugates. So we received the particles from Handsome at Limited Toronto, uh, and we got the particles 0 0.25 to 1 millimeter. The BIOS plus the C3 and the BIOS plus C6 were prepared by mixing these granules with the appropriate amounts of the C3 and C6 conjugate in a distal water. So these drugs are prepared as powders and you can actually make stock solutions. So we are already thinking in advance that when we go to the clinical application of this, this will either come as granules pre-loaded with these graphs, or you can actually mix the solution with the BIOS for a few minutes and then place them in the defect. And the 0 0.3 concentration we used was based on previous experiments performed as the ideal concentration, which gives us the most amount of bone stimulation. Now, in terms of in vitro characterization of these BIOS groups with and without the drugs before implantation, we performed scanning electron microscopy, where we wanted to observe the microstructure of these uh, graph materials before implantation without the drugs and with the drugs at different magnifications. What was also important for us as scientists to note was, does the addition of these C3 and C6 conjugates change in any way the chemical formulation or structure of BIOS. So to evaluate that, we perform extra diffraction. And uh, what, we, what we conclusively showed was that adding the C3 and the C6 to this BIOS material does not in any way change the chemical structure or the formulation of the material, which is important. Briefly, we used the critical size defect model, which was 4.3 millimeters. We place an incision. We use a trefine burr to create a through and through defect in the mandible. We pack it with either the BIOS alone or the BIOS with C3 and C6, all randomized. And then after two and four weeks, we euthanize the animals. We retrieve the implants. We do all the processing and then we evaluate it via micro CT, backscattered imaging, and also histology. So if you look at the results we, um, we kind of saw, uh, we performed the micro CT to not only visualize the defects at various stages, but also to provide us with 3D volume constructions uh, to visually have a look at the defects. And when we look at the backscattered electron microscopic images, uh, you can appreciate the difference between two weeks and four weeks for all three groups. And you can appreciate that you see the granules being in the defect with bone actually growing from the periphery inside. Just based on the visual examination, if you look at the control at four weeks by C3 and C6, if you look closely, the C6 actually shows more bone infiltration going towards the center in comparison to the bone um, uh, growing at the control. And then, we did the same thing with the histology. And again, this is just a qualitative visual representation. And again, if you compare two weeks to the four weeks, what you observe is that for the BIOS control, in comparison to C3, which has more bone, and then C6, which you can actually see the green bone actually infiltrating almost halfway into the defect filled uh, uh, space. Now, this is all good, but we had to quantify this. So in order to quantify this, what we did is we wanted to check the bone formation by percentage. And what we saw is at two weeks, in comparison to the control, we had significantly more bone growth for the BIOS with the C3 and also for the BIOS with C6. At four weeks, this trend continued and was significant, but also what was interesting was that the C6 group had significantly more bone growth than the C3 group, which means that even amongst the conjugates, 
one conjugate as working better than the other, which was what we kind of anticipated based on uh, what I showed you in terms of the more potent C6 having two EP4 molecules. In terms of the graph percentage remaining, what is interesting is that, and we already know, knew this, and we didn't expect the BIOS to resorb. So we had no significant reduction of the graph material uh, amongst the groups, and there was no significantly uh, reduced graph material, uh, which we observed. Another important concept we wanted to check was the bone formation in available space. Now, a lot of studies do present bone formation percentages, but when you're talking about non or less degradable graph materials, what is more crucial is the bone formation in available space, because it does not matter what drug or what you use, bone can only grow when a space is available. So if you pack a prefect and it only has 30% free space, and if the graft is not going to degrade, you're only going to get so much bone growing in. So this is a more accurate representation of bone growing into the available space. And again, this mimics or matches with what we saw for bone formation, that the C6 worked better than the C3, which in turn worked better than the C uh, with, a, with the control. So the main results were that adding these C3 and C6 conjugates to the granules resulted in more and faster bone growth. We also checked uh, and we compared the same material for two and four weeks, which is essentially the similar data, but it's just presented in a different way. So nothing new to show here. Uh, just wanted to put it out there that we did th do this as well. And in terms of the conclusions, what we saw is that BIOS granules that contained the novel anabolic drug conjugate C3 and C6 resulted in significantly greater new bone formation and an increased rate of bone formation when compared to the BIOS controls, sorry for the typo. Uh, the BIOS granules with the C6 resulted in significantly greater bone formation than what was achieved with the C3 containing granules, which means that at least preclinically, we can say that the C6 has more potential uh, for clinical use than the C3. What is left and what is important is the need for dose optimization and safety studies before the full initiation of a clinical trial to determine the clinical effectiveness and utility. And uh, with uh, Mesentech, we have already started working on this. And interestingly, when I presented uh, on the podium at the AAID, which is the American Academy of Implant Dentistry and later at the American Academy of Perio annual meeting in Las Vegas in Chicago, uh, somebody from Geislick, Switzerland, uh, was present for my presentation. They reported back to Switzerland. They got very interested. They contacted us. Uh, we with Mesentech have already signed a no, non-disclosure agreement, and we're in talks to see if uh, BIOS would be interested or Geislick would be interested in taking this technology to produce the second or the new generation of BIOS biomaterials. So the clinical significance of this research and work is to potentially have a new therapy to treat bone defects by a local delivery of a novel bone anabolic drug without the unwanted systemic side effects. And it would potentially pave the way for development of more predictable clinical treatments with accelerated bone regeneration for dental applications such as ridge augmentation prior to implant placement or bone augmentation in any other maxillofacial application. These are some of the references which were used to uh, make this talk. I would like to acknowledge the collaborative um, support from all the partnering institutions such as University of Toronto, Dalhousie University, uh, Mount Sinai Hospital Toronto, uh, Simon Fraser University in British Columbia and Mesentech. And also for, uh, I would like to acknowledge the financial support from MyTax Accelerate and the Network for Oral Health Research, which has not only funded our research uh, for the past few years, but have also been the source for uh, me getting my salary, which is very important, I guess. Um, and with that, I thank you, and I'm going to unshare my screen and turn on my video. Uh, thank you for listening. Perfect, thanks so, thanks much, so much, Dr. Dr. Sheehy. That, uh, that was great, uh, lots of info in there. Um, and clearly some, some great advancements that you have as well. So that's really, really cool. We got, uh, we got quite a few questions that came in uh, over the time. So um, what I've done is I've kind of 
uh, listed them all here and I'll try and get through, uh, get through most of them for sure. Um, so, uh, so why don't we, we start right now. What I'm just going to do here is I'm going to uh, share my screen as well. Can you see mine as well, uh, doctor? I do, yeah. Okay. That's not a question though, is it? That's not the question. Okay. <laughs> my Perfect. first question. Um, okay, so uh, my first question here will be um, more a general question uh, from your experience. Um, w in what situations would you use bio-os? Okay, in, 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 from, uh, this is from Aisha. Okay, thank you for that question. So based on my um, limited clinical experience in comparison to the attendees, some of them have years and years and sometimes decades of experience. You would use BIOS for applications where you are not concerned or you don't want a rapid uh, resorption. You actually want the graph material to be there and structurally available uh, as a graph material for a longer period of time. So uh, without naming specific applications, at any point where you want the graph material to have a mechanical integrity and stay there as a scaffold for a longer period of time, you would choose a material like BIOS over a calcium phosphate, which can disintegrate and kind of uh, fragment and go away very quickly. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, that, that's great, actually, explanation of that. <laughs> um, it's, instead of just naming specific indications, so that's great. Um, so another question here from Adita Patel. Um, uh, any study to look into different BP, uh, BMP levels in DFDBA between different companies? Uh, unfortunately, uh, till last week, which was when I kind of was, I, I wouldn't say, unless something has come up this week, I have not come across anything. But thanks to Dr. Patel for that. And uh, he's one of our instructors at Dalhousie. And uh, he's a periodist and a grad from U of T and also from Dalhousie. Uh, that would actually be a great research project to actually undertake. So... <laughs> Thanks for the idea, and perhaps uh, I can discuss with you how we can actually get that research, because I think there's a gap in the literature uh, when it comes to that, because personally, I'm not aware of any study which actually uh, does that comparison. Hmm. Cool. So maybe another topic for a different time. <laughs> um, so I have another question here from Fake. Um, so he has in quote uh, in quotations here when the when the particles are bigger than one hundred the de uh, the degradation is lowering the pH. So the question is, um, do we expect the body would try to overcome the acidic pH, remembering that the body in normal state is toward alkaline. Therefore, uh, it might be the giant cells do that by doing the environment more alkaline than acidic. So have it, uh, so, the long question. So have it been the pH measured exactly? Right, so uh, I really like that question because uh, that could be a, an hour's topic on its own, but to just try and simply put it so that it's clear how that works, uh, it's not the general environment which actually gets acidic. What really happens is these uh, giant cells or even osteoclasts, they latch onto the surface of these large particles. They have a sealing zone which forms, and then they produce these enzymes which locally erode the surface. It's exactly like using an etchant or a acid material on a mineralized surface. So it's not the whole environment which is getting acidic right now. It's actually the cell which is producing these enzymes and acids on the surface of the graft, and then that particular local area of that graft is getting eroded and then it makes it easier for those materials to be taken away and be uh, resorbed. I hope that answers. Um, I, I tried. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks for that. Um, so uh, it's uh, Giska has asked this question. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. Um, so uh, she says, thanks for the, for the great 
great discussion. Um, wondering that if our native bone has been lost due to defects, how the bone graft growth is following the original native bones dimensions. So uh, is it something that we can regulate by like, customizing or is it a natural phenomena by our body? That's a great question. So if we're particularly talking about a bone defect, which is of a certain shape and form, and let's imagine it being like a kind of a cup or a well, then it's kind of easy because you just pack in the granules and if you cover it up with a membrane and don't allow the soft tissue ingrowth, you expect the bone fill to happen and then remodeling to take place. I think what uh, the, the, uh, the attendee is asking is, if you have a particular sort of a bone defect uh, where an anatomical structure is lost, that is where it gets uh, difficult. And for that, what I would like to answer is, uh, I was fortunate during my PhD to actually go and work in Germany uh, for a little bit in a place uh, by the name of Würzburg, University of Würzburg. And they have a group over there with Uwe Guburik, uh, and they do these customized 3D printed calcium phosphates. And then what you can essentially do is, if you have, for example, a whole zygoma missing, you can make a 3D printed calcium phosphate. And if you load it with any bone stimulator, such as a PMP or these conjugates we're talking about, then you can have a more sort of a controlled anatomical bone growth, which not only grows into the scaffold, and then the scaffold kind of resorbs. So I think the question was pertaining to a specific uh, anatomical sort of a defect rather than just a general bone fail. Right, cool. Yeah, that's a, that was a really good question. Um, so I have another one here. Um, is there a true osteoinductive grafting material other than autogenous bone graft? If you're talking about uh, a xenograft or an alloplast, there's none I know of. Okay. <laughs> Easy answer. <laughs> you, you, you can mix, you can mix uh, growth factors into a bone graft material and then implant it and then you can enhance the osteoinductive potential. But I, if the question is, as, and maybe I'm wrong, but I think the question is, can I go to the market, get a material, use it directly off the shelf being osteoinductive? I don't think that uh, alloplast exists at the moment. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, so another follow, another question here. Um, is there enough evidence on EMD uh, and enhancing bone regeneration? There are some uh, scientific studies which show the um, you know, enamel matrix derivatives to be uh, showing potential. Uh, that again, uh, I, I actually uh, attended a talk by a colleague of mine who's at Harvard uh, recently. It was, uh, I think, by Straumann. And he did a really good talk on endogain. So uh, that is, again, a topic which is on its own an hour long. So uh, yeah. I guess we can discuss all of that. But yes, there is definitely literature which shows uh, the, the, the ability of those EMD materials, which basically have a melogenin, uh, to induce mineralization. OK. Um, so I have maybe one more here. Um, a lot of people are chiming in and, and really uh, appreciating the presentation. I just wanted to let you know that as well. Appreciate um, it. So again, uh, they, they mentioned thanks again for the excellent lecture. Um, do you have any concerns about long-term effects of the residual uh, molecule binding uh, to the osteoclast increasing uh, uh, RANKL uh, or affect long-term remodeling? So that is a great question. And I luckily had a chance to read who wrote it. And that can only oh. be expected by a very good <laughs> friend and a colleague of mine. She's a prosthodontist uh, and she is in Houston right now. And she's uh, from McGill. And then she did her uh, specialty in the States. So thank you, Dr. Srivastava, for joining in. Uh, yes, so I, I was expecting somebody to ask that question. I'm glad somebody did. Uh, the biggest question we have uh, for this is, now you have the linker which breaks away and the EP4 works. Now the alendronate is still attached to the bone. So her question is, does that have any detrimental effects long term? The good thing about this graph, and we have performed various safety and efficacy studies, and we're doing more with, uh, we will be doing more, is that once you 
you cap the amide portion of this alendronate, it actually becomes inactivated. So essentially, it's, it, once it binds to the bone, it just works as a targeting agent. So the EP4 piggybacks on it with this string, which is this uh, hydrolyzable linker. This goes, binds to the bone, the linker breaks, the alendronate remains inactive, does not contribute to any osteoclast apoptosis or any other increase in the rankle based on the fact that we have inactivated the site of, uh, of alendronate, which needs to be there to stimulate all these cascades. Mm. Wow, so it's a very okay. smart design in terms of uh, uh, using alendronate, which as soon as we hear bisphosphonate, we have this negative connotation which comes to mind. And that's why I always in my presentations use the words in bold inactive, because right. if it's not inactive, then you're defeating the whole purpose of regeneration because what bisphosphonates is going to do is it's going to stop the osteoclast from coming in, which means there's going to be a lack of remodeling, which is not what we want. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. mm, cool. Um, okay, so let me just see. Yeah, everyone is just thanking uh, you for the, the presentation. I guess it's a good time for me to do the same. Um, you know, it was really great to have you on, doctor. Um, I thought like a lot of the information was was really interesting um, and I really enjoyed your explanation of them and the visual picture that we could all kind of imagine when you're going through these explanations. Not uh, all of these things are very easy to grasp right away, but I felt that uh, that the, the visualization of all this stuff really helped. So before we log off, there's this comment by Dr. Bozak out of University of Toronto. And uh, first of all, thank you for joining in, Dr. Bozak. It's been a year I haven't seen you, uh, but luckily we get to see each other on Facebook and LinkedIn. So his, his, his point is very valid, and that is something I think about all the time, that what he says is that when developing newborn graft materials, why is the collagen component of the material so little discussed? And, uh, and how can we ensure that the collagen remains native throughout the material conditioning in the lab? Now, this is a great point because we know that when we take either xenografts or we take other materials, the extensive chemical uh, processing which is required for allowing us to use this material uh, for clinical use does denature the collagen matrix as well, which means that you essentially are left with an inorganic component of bone, which is not essentially bone at all. It's a completely different material because you have taken away or altered the collagen sequencing and the structure, which means these materials are gonna be more brittle uh, without going into details. I have read several research publications where uh, uh, xenografts of bovine origin, when people have tried to screw them in, they fracture. And that's one of the reasons because collagen is what it gives you the plasticity. So that's a great point. And I think when we are talking about uh, any sort of xenograft or an allograft, it is important that uh, the manufacturers take into account the processing and how it affects the, uh, the collagen structure and if somehow it could be preserved. Cool. Sorry, I missed that, uh, that one. And I actually, I did realize I missed another one here too. Go for it. Um, if you have a second. So uh, they're, it's just, they're just asking, can you please shed some light on how the appropriate concentration of 0.3% was determined for yourself? Yeah. It, it, it was de definitely not something uh, based on pin the donkey's tail. Uh, we, we didn't have a dartboard and we just use it. So this is based on several publications we have already worked on. Uh, okay. We have done a lot of in vivo testing, cell work, in vitro testing. And based on the preclinical trials we performed on Calvaria model, on the osteoporosis model, we had a range of concentrations. And what was interesting to note is you would logically think that higher the concentration of this stimulator, you would have a better effect. But the way prostaglandins work and its analogs, the lower the concentration, it actually works better. Now, this is something I cannot explain to you in two minutes. Uh, I would need 20 minutes to explain because uh, how it works. But our 0 0.3 concentration is based on what evidence shows to us works best in an in vivo environment. Having said that, there is still need for further dose optimization studies to come up with the exact or the ideal sort of a 
concentration which we would require for the C3 or C6 conjugates to be loaded into our graph materials, be it synthetics or be it uh, BIOS. Okay, great. Thanks. That question was from uh, Sumeya Hassan. So thanks very much. Good question. Yeah, actually, there's an, I got one more here as well. Um, so when you proceed the DBBM, deprotonize, uh, sorry, uh, deprotonization, dimension adjustment, sterilization, uh, did you use some chemicals? And uh, how did you ensure the chemicals didn't induce toxic, toxicity? So first of all, to make sure that we limited the confounding for factors to a minimum, we did not alter the BIOS we received from Geislick and Hansamed in any way at all. Mm -hmm. So the controls were used straight out of the wild into the surgeries. As far as the C3 and the C6, there were stock solutions of the C3 and the C6 already. And we had a protocol, again, based on studies where we saw how much absorption of the drug happens on BIOS uh, based on different concentrations and times of uh, uh, diffusion. So we had a strict protocol whereby once the vial was open uh, and BIOS granules were taken out, we did not alter it at all in any way by any heat, chemical, or any other uh, method. So it was taken out sterile, mixed with the grafts, and used. Okay, cool. Thanks for the, uh, the question. Another thing which is important to add is we have already tested, and this is what we used for our uh, calvarial model as well, if you take your C3 and C6 conjugates and mix it with a synthetic graft, or you mix it with BIOS, and if you want to sterilize it, we have already shown that the autoclaving, which is done at 121 degrees at 15 PSI for 30 minutes, does not chemically degrade or change the chemical structure of the drug in any way. And the same is to be said for gamma irradiation because autoclaving is not an acceptable method of sterilization for clinical use. So you would need to, whatever graph material you prepare or you mix it with, it would need to be gamma irradiated. And we have conclusively shown that the chemical structure of the conjugates remains unchanged due to the gamma irradiation or autoclaving, which is a huge plus, which means that if hypothetically a company like Geislake would want to take their already processed BIOS materials, mix it at their processing plant with the C3C6, they could gamma irradiate it, pack it into their vials and send it straight to the clinician to be used. So ideally we would not want the clinician to be, we don't want this material to be dependent on the clinician mixing appropriate things for appropriate times because that is including, that actually allows for a confounding factor which could result in variation. So those are some of the things which we have already thought about and have already checked, uh, which, which seem to be indicating that we are in the right track in terms of uh, one day, hopefully soon, uh, seeing a clinical trial with these materials in humans. Hmm. Cool. Well, thanks again, uh, Giska, uh, for that question. Um, Again, there's a lot of uh, a lot of talk. Everyone's uh, really enjoying uh, your answers and your input here, uh, doctor. So appreciate it. Um, I think I'll just basically, you know, close by saying here. Uh, I think that if if uh, any of the attendees today and participants want uh, to, or they stumble upon some more questions, uh, they can feel free to to reach out to myself or, of course, uh, Doctor uh, Sheik here uh, to address them. I know. I'm sure you're on multiple different uh, social media, uh, you know, outlets such as LinkedIn and, and uh, of course, uh, through, through email. Um, we'll be sending out the recording of this to all of our uh, registrants and participants in the next week or so. Um, is there any closing remarks uh, that you'd like to, to close up with? Well, uh, I, I, I would like to thank Hans Samet uh, for uh, inviting me to do this. I would like to thank Dr. Tatiana Molina, yourself. Um, it's been a great experience. Um, I hope to continue working with you and having a good uh, relationship in the future as well. Great. Okay. And all, obviously, many thanks to all the attendees and for their great questions and their patience. Uh, for I, I think I went a little over time, but uh, there was a lot to unpack in this presentation, and I tried to keep it to a minimum because 
uh, we could have had this for three hours and uh, I would still be speaking. Yeah, well, we would go into tomorrow and you wouldn't have tomorrow off anymore. Absolutely. Okay, so thanks so much everyone uh, for joining. Have a fantastic evening and hopefully we'll all see you again soon at uh, Handsome Ed's next Table Talk uh, discussion. Cheers everyone.